If I ask someone my age what came to mind when I say the Shaggy Dog, they'd probably think of a forgotten 2006 movie starring Tim Allen. If I ask someone three times my age what they thought of when I said the Shaggy Dog, they'd probably think of a 1959 black and white movie that was a huge deal for about two decades. But some people, somewhere in between the former and the latter, would think of a couple of weird TV movies that very few people probably remember existing. There were a total of five Shaggy Dog movies. That's right, it was a full franchise and it used to be a very valuable one to Disney. Nowadays, the Shaggy Dog franchise has fallen far out of relevance. It's one of those movies that was a huge deal for its time and had a pretty big impact but nobody even really acknowledges anymore. There's plenty of classic films out there that continue to persist in pop culture due to a variety of things. Film majors encountering them in their textbooks, parents raising their kids on them, streaming services promoting them, cheap $5 Walmart shirts with their logos, and fans of cinema catching up on movies they missed out on. But unlike Pulp Fiction, R.E.T. are some of the most memorable black and white comedy films, The Shaggy Dog isn't relevant to today's classic films aesthetic or sub-pop culture of classic cinema. No other movies or TV shows really give it many homages, and its name isn't really brought up in anything. Every film textbook I've ever been assigned has never once mentioned it, and despite being one of Disney's most profitable live-action films for its time, not even Disney cares about it anymore. Man Turns Into Dog is a concept you can only get so much comedic and storytelling mileage with, and it's not hard to see why Disney isn't pushing out Shaggy Dog Funko Pops or merchandise, or making Shaggy Dog films like their Marvel or Star Wars movies. However, despite all of that, it was popular enough to justify at least five movies over half of a century, including a trilogy that was told in a non-linear nature over three decades. Technically four. So naturally, I watched all five of them and will now compare and contrast them. The first movie, according to a promo I found, is the funniest adventure that's ever happened to anyone. It's the funniest adventure that ever happened to anyone. It's somewhat, very partially, only technically kind of somewhat an adaption of the novel The Hound of Florence by Felix Saltine. Not sure if I pronounced that right. The movie stars Wilbur Wilby Daniels, the protagonist of the original trilogy in the Shaggy Dog universe. His father, Wilson Daniels, hates dog to a comical extent. Most people love dogs. I suppose I'm some kind of a freak because I don't. This is part of a bit, in that Wilson is a retired mailman. It's that whole classic mailman versus dog scenario. Right off the bat, I can't help but notice how back then when this movie was made, a mailman could apparently afford a house nicer than any house I've ever lived in or stayed at. Wilby, on the other hand, is an average boy who has the quirk of making wacky inventions. He often spends time with his little brother Montgomery, Moochie Daniels, and he has a rival named Buzz Miller, who he seems to have some kind of friendship with at the start of the movie, but they're currently clashing over a crush they have on the same girl named Francesca. Her family recently moved into town, and she has an old English sheepdog named Chiffon. Chiffon is the one and only Shaggy Dog himself. Wilby and Buzz very awkwardly befriend Francesca and end up going to a museum together. At the museum, Wilby encounters Professor Plumcut, a man who he used to deliver newspapers to. They briefly talk about all sorts of legends in the Borgia family, which was a real noble family often the subject of political affairs in the 15th and 16th centuries. They were often accused of the following crimes, adultery, incest, simony, theft, bribery, and murder, especially murder related to arsenic poisoning. Typical subjects brought up in other Disney movies. According to Wikipedia, they had many rivals, and there might be evidence that exists that all this evil was a one-dimensional characteristic as a result of undeserved contemporary critiques. Anyway, Wilby accidentally ends up taking home a cursed ring that apparently belonged to the Borgia, and then, long story short, this cursed adultery bribery murdering thing turns Wilby into Francesca's dog at random intervals. Wilby is told the only way to break the curse is to perform an act of true heroism. This is where the movie settles into its primary focus, Wilby's quirky antics switching back and forth between dog and boy. It's a funny concept and it wasn't really done yet at the time, and the visual effects, while strange, are legitimately kind of endearing and neat in a way. All around, it's a pretty straightforward and funny black and white comedy that I'd recommend to anyone who likes old movies. However, the writers thought that the plot could use a bit more than just the awkward tension going on between Wilby being a dog and his dad hating dogs. As about halfway in, once the jokes start to dry out a bit, the movie randomly introduces a spy subplot, which, in all honesty, makes the movie even better and more likably weird. You've got a movie about a boy, with a dad who has a seething hatred of canines, who comes across a cursed ring and turns into a dog. It's already unique for its time and very weird, but then there's a spy subplot. It's so specific on top of all of that, and such an inspired mashup of different things that I find it really endearing. But that's enough of me gushing over it. I should actually explain how it all goes down. In dog form, Wilby overhears Francesca's adoptive father speaking with a confidant of his about how he has a vague scheme to steal government secrets. 
Wilby resolves the arc with his father in a scene in which I can only describe as him coming out to him by revealing he's a dog. Papa Wilson proves that he's actually probably one of the most morally chill dads from this era, anger issues aside, due to him immediately embracing the oddities and telling his son he'll love him no matter what. And then he takes a key role as an ally in the final act of the movie. Father, son, and son's friends then work together to expose Francesca's adoptive father, and in the process, get him arrested for illegal espionage. Wilby's act of true heroism frees him of the curse. Francesca moves to Paris, bestowing chiffon upon the family, which Wilson is now cool with as he's overcome his hatred of dogs, despite still being highly allergic, but uh, let's not talk about that. Wilby and Buzz decide to just be buddies. Perhaps just a little bit more. Actually, no. Wilby starts dating a girl named Allison for some reason. She's not really relevant until now. Everything is wrapped up in a nice bow. And then we get to the next movie, which is a little bit tricky because there's two next movies. In order of release, we have the Shaggy DA, but chronologically, the third movie takes place between the original and the Shaggy DA. For some reason, the Shaggy Dog is a franchise that has an elaborate timeline, thanks to the existence of multiple remakes and an interquill. For clarity, I'll be talking about the Shaggy DA next. The Shaggy DA released in 1976, 17 years after its predecessor. Granted, this was back when sequels weren't as much of an obsession and weren't taking up most of Hollywood's release schedule. The one and only character to return in this movie is Wilby, played by a new actor. He's now an adult, and like father like son, he is also just as angry as his dad was, perhaps even just a little bit more angry. And also an attorney for some reason, which doesn't really track for the inventor personality they had in the previous movie, but okay I guess. He returns to his hometown for a vacation where he is robbed. It's rumored the local district attorney, John Slade, is responsible due to allegedly having ties to organized crime. Because of this, Wilby runs for district attorney, with his wife Betty Daniels serving as his campaign manager. Wilby goes out trying to get himself votes, awkwardly trying to win over the hearts of local people. Meanwhile, the two people that robbed the Daniels earlier in the film steal the Borgia ring from the first movie in the local museum. They try to pawn it off, and the only person they manage to sell it to is a local ice cream man named Tim, who has an old English sheepdog named Elwood. Tim takes the ring, planning to use it to get engaged to his lady. Wilby goes on television and hears about the ring being stolen. He panics and experiences PTSD over the first movie, to which his wife doesn't really believe him when he tells her he previously turned into a dog. Nearby, Tim reads the inscription on the ring, and Elwood vanishes, hijacking Wilby's body moments before the cameras roll. Wilby runs away in his dog body and encounters Tim, who has no idea why his dog can suddenly talk. The spell wears off and then Wilby is in Helbert to fight the ring. So begins a cycle of Wilby attending events and turning into a dog and encountering Tim who believes he is Elwood, and having to deal with Tim trying to monetize his status as a talking dog to make bank. Eventually, one of Slade's confidants discovers Wilby's curse and decides to use it to gain the upper hand in the election. This leads to Wilby being imprisoned in a dog pound after Slade reads off the curse multiple times to ensure the curse's effect won't wear off for a long time. Ignoring some new lore stating that reciting the incantation too much can transfer the spell off to him. I'm pretty sure this is the only time it's brought up in the series and that it's never acknowledged again. While at the pound, Wilby is able to talk to a variety of other dogs in what is one of the most solemn scenes of the movie. There's an old hound dog singing Swing Low Sweet Chariot and he's the best character in the franchise. Swing low. Sweet chariot. The dogs help Wilby escape, and then Tim and Wilby's son Brian help him find evidence connecting Slade to his organized crime. The dogs from the pound help Wilby trick Slade and get the ring back and incriminate him. Wilby gets elected district attorney, and Tim gets engaged to his girlfriend. All the dogs from the pound are adopted, and there is a happy ending. This is the end of Wilby's story. All in all, a pretty decent comedy film that continues with the first movie began without heavily relying on it too much. The election angle is a bit strange, but it was post-Watergate era and kind of a parody of it, and it helps it stick out as its own movie. So what's next? How could you possibly continue this concept? By going back in time! In 1987, 11 years after the Shaggy DA came out, another Shaggy Dog movie released. This time it was a TV movie with the grandiose title of The Return of the Shaggy Dog. Return of the Shaggy Dog was near impossible to find. It's not available to stream anywhere online. I don't believe a DVD was ever produced. And there's only a handful of VHS copies to purchase online. If you look around, you can eventually find a place to watch it, but it's nowhere near as accessible as it should be. And I find it really disappointing that it's not available on Disney+, Plus, which is supposed to be the go-to place to find even the most obscure Disney content. Right off the bat, Return of the Shaggy Dog already feels a bit out of place. It's a TV movie, it's an interquill that takes place between the first two, and it doesn't continue the tradition of having a stylized opening intro both of the previous two movies had. 
Once again, the movie has a completely new set of actors, and it's set around the time Willby first proposed to Betty and was still early in his career as an attorney. Professor Plumcut from the first movie returns, and he's given a dramatic death scene, like he's a character that we all recognize who is really big and memorable, even though he was only in like one scene of the original movie. His dying words are the incantation, and he says he wishes for the border ring to be inherited by Willby. The professor's caretakers instead take the ring for themselves as a new series of hijinks begin. Alongside Plumcut, the movie also brings Wilby's younger brother Moochie back into relevance. Moochie, now an adult, is struggling with his career as a casting director. It's a pretty major repeat of the first movie and doesn't have as much to set it apart in the way that the Shaggy DA did. Wilby has on and off transformations, but this time it causes relationship troubles with Betty as their wedding approaches. Moochie is able to help him undo the curse to fulfill his marriage and find the perfect dog for his commercial. It's the least memorable of the original trilogy, but it still has a lot of funny antics and quirky scenes that make it a worthwhile watch. There's a pretty great car chase scene near the end of the film with Wilby in dog form, but other than that, I can't help but feel that the series was reaching its natural conclusion. However, Disney had other ideas. The Shaggy Dog is a 1994 remake of the 1959 movie, not to be confused with the 2006 remake with the same name. After writing themselves into a wall with Wilby, the next course of action to continue this concept was to start from square one. This movie was twice as hard to find as Return of the Shaggy Dog. There is no way to stream it, impossible to search for copies since it only brings up results related to the other two movies in the series with the same name, sites that claim to host it wouldn't play the video file, and so on. I managed to track down a VHS copy, but I only managed to see 75% of it, as most of the sound and video is corrupted. If someone hunted for this movie even more seriously, they could probably find it, but it's scarily close to being lost media. AKA Disney Plus, please do something about this. Anyway, rant over. This time the movie actually starts with the Spice Up plot instead of saving it for the halfway point. There's not a whole lot to say about it as it pretty closely follows the first movie with some very small changes. Wilby, Moochie, and Francesca have their names intact, but most of the other characters had their names changed, such as Wilson now being Ronald and Buzz being Trey. Wilby is now played by Scott Wayner, known for being the animated Aladdin and Steve in Full House in its reboot, Fuller House. Back and forth transformations, Wilby reveals he's a dog to his dad, the evil spy plot gets foiled, and Francesca moves away. It's basically the same movie, but now in 1994, with a couple of small dashes of added racism, and also someone gets called a simp. Daniels is a simp. Hmm? This movie didn't spawn any more sequels of its own or any other remakes of the previous movies, so it seemingly failed to revive interest in the series. Something interesting about the movie is that it ends with a dedication of sorts to Boomer the dog. At first I assumed it had to do with the dog they used in the movie, or maybe a crew member's dog. Then I wondered if it was some sort of obscure production label for Shaggy Dog movies. Searching it up, I actually found out that it might have a connection to an individual who actually goes by Boomer the Dog. Boomer the Dog has a website where he goes over how he got the name and identity of Boomer the Dog, and even cites the Shaggy Day as part of the reason why. I tried to find out if this was a shout out to him, but I couldn't find any concrete answers. The voice clip that plays when the Boomer the Dog logo is shown actually sounds just a little bit similar to Boomer's voice in a couple of videos I found online. Anyway, an entire decade then passed before the next movie in the series was released. In 2006, a very sudden remake of The Shaggy Dog was released. More of a reboot this time though. It combines elements from multiple films in the original series, but other than that, it's completely different. The movie focuses on a man named Dave Douglas, played by Tim Allen, rather than Wilby Daniels. He is a district attorney, a nod to the Shaggy DA. The movie immediately begins with mythicism tropes and creates a big lore surrounding an ancient dog named Ki Ying Po, who, rather than living seven dog years in one human year, has a reversed process and lives seven times as long or something. The movie's kind of vague with it. There are a group of evil men working for a company known as Grant and Strickland attempting to kidnap Ki Ying Po. They are led by a man named Dr. Kozak, played by Robert Downey Jr., just two years before his debut as Tony Stark in 2008's Iron Man. They manage to kidnap Ki Yang Po, and they perform various experiments on other animals and create a series of mutations that all fail to succeed. After an extensive, wacky escape sequence, Dave's daughter, an activist named Carly, encounters Ki Yang Po. She takes him home, which leads to Dave being bit by him, which begins a strange sequence where his DNA is shown mutating into little dogs in CGI. I am a dog! You are a toy! There's a weird, terrible, awful, gradual, no good, disgusting, kind of gross and unsettling progression of his transformation. We see this between him lapping up breakfast cereal like a dog or catching frisbees in his mouth. He occasionally wakes up back in human form, but for the most part he's stuck as a dog, who his family just assumes is actually Ki Yang Po. Unlike in the previous continuities, in this one people cannot talk while in dog form. 
preventing him from being able to tell his family what's going on. Shortly after his identity is revealed, Dr. Kozak kidnaps Dave in his dog form and tries to euthanize him. After being bitten and infected by Dave, he gets pulled away by court summons. All the mutated animals from earlier in the movie help Dave escape by convincing him to meditate and go back into human form. After he escapes with the animals, he turns back into dog form and attempts to run off to the courtroom where Dr. Kozak is present. In the courtroom, Dave tricks the infected Dr. Kozak into turning into a dog. He is arrested, the Douglases seemingly adopt Keying Poe, Dave fixes his broken marriage, and the mutant animals are taken into protection. Overall, it's a bit more needlessly complicated than the original series of movies, and there's so much meaningless family melodrama. The family isn't really likable, and we have no reason to really care about what's going on with their dynamic. It was panned by critics and mostly forgotten. Despite this, it seems to have mostly replaced or simply just obscured the classic Shaggy Dog status in the public's movie-going conscious. I rarely hear anyone talk about the Shaggy Dog, but most people who I do hear or see talk about it talk about this version of the movie with no knowledge that it's a remake. So with all that out of the way, let's discuss the lore and development of these movies. I can't lie, watching all five of these in such a quick succession feels like it kind of fried my brain. So this will probably use up the rest of my remaining energy for like a month. Let's talk about the Borgia Ring. It's an inspired choice to include it and have it be pivotal to four out of five movies in the series. Each movie has will be, or in one particular case, Dave, changing back and forth between dog and man. Despite how elaborate the timeline placement of each movie is, the rest of it isn't really consistent. In the first movie, the inscription on the ring is what triggers the transformations. The transformations happen involuntarily, on and off, and the only way to break the cycle is to perform an act of true heroism. In the Shaggy DA, however, he turns into a dog for a short burst of time every time the inscription is read and then it wears off after a while. Then, in Return of the Shaggy Dog, he changes into a dog every time the inscription is read, and only changes back once it has been read again. And due to corruption, I honestly can't really remember what it was in 1994, but I'm assuming it was closer to the first movie. And then 2006 decides to turn it into an affection, dropping the ring entirely. All around, it really doesn't matter that much since these are comedy movies, and the changes help them, you know, create jokes and pace the plot a bit better based on what they're going for, but it is kind of weird. The original trilogy of Shaggy Dog films technically released over the course of four decades. The first one came out in 1959, and the last one came out in 1987. Between the 1950s and the 2000s, the only decade in that time frame to not get its own Shaggy Dog movie were the 1960s. There isn't a whole lot to say about the development of the TV movies or the 2006 film, but the first movie had a pretty big impact for its time that completely recontextualizes why there's so many sequels and reboots. Walt Disney bought the right to Saltine's 1923 novel, A Bambi, A Life in the Woods. Before its release in May 1941, Disney bought even more film rights for Saltine novels. These included Bambi's Children, Perry, Rennie, City Jungle, and The Hound of Florence. He didn't actually want to make Bambi's Children himself, but didn't like the idea of anyone else making it either. Though he intended to adapt all the others as animations, Saltine then died in 1945. Ten years later, in June 1955, Walt Disney said he still had no plans to do anything with The Hound of Florence. Eventually, he pitched what would become the Shaggy Dog to ABC when they asked him to make another television series. They turned him down, to what she claimed he was hopping mad. This encouraged him to contact Bill Walsh, a film producer, screenwriter, and comic author who worked for Walt Disney Productions, to co-produce The Shaggy Dog as a movie with him. The casting of the movie consisted of many actors featured in other Disney works, including The Mickey Mouse Club. These actors included Tommy Kirk as Wilby, Tim Considine as Buzz, Nanette Funicello as Allison. Kirk and Funicello went on to often reappear in other Disney works together, such as The Misadventures of Merlene Jones, Babes in Toyland, and more. Additionally, both of them also appeared in American International Pictures' film, Pajama Party. Both of them went on to star in other movies by the studio, but they didn't often appear together. Costadine went on to star in My Three Sons with Fred McMurray, McMurray himself playing Volson in the first movie. McMurray and Kirk also worked together again in the Flubber series of movies. When it came to finding the dog, it took multiple months to find the right dog to play Siobhan. They eventually casted Sam the Dog, this being his only movie credit. He was selected from a group of over 20 dogs they had previewed. Originally, he was only there for principal work while their dogs were used for specialized tasks. But he ended up being so talented, they were able to just use him for everything. The cast loved working with Sam, with Mac Murray stating, Shaggy kept the whole cast and crew in stitches. He even broke me up a couple of times and also stated, he's a natural screen personality. Interestingly, Kirk claimed that this was meant to be a two-part television series, and that it was only spliced together into a film at the very last minute. When the movie came out, it was a big success. 
is Walt Disney Productions' most financially successful film to date, making around nine times its budget during its initial release. It was even more profitable than 1959's highest grossing film, Ben-Hur, due to its budget. This movie's success kicked off a series of Disney flicks described as gimmick comedies by Disney historian Leonard Maltin. These movies often use fantastical elements for comedic storytelling. These movies include the Flubber series and Dexter Riley trilogy, which both take place in the same fictional town of Medfield where various Shaggy Dog movies take place. Given that, it's not hard to see why Disney tried to follow up on it. The Shaggy DA itself performed rather well. It being a satire of American politics following the Watergate era pretty much worked in its favor. And it did well enough to justify another movie down the line featuring the same characters, but the performance of the TV movies didn't seem like they pleased Disney well enough given the next attempt they made was a hard reboot right after another reboot. The 2006 Shaggy Dog movie is a very much 2000s era comedy, both in its desperation and style of humor. I tried to search into its development, but I couldn't find much. In interviews, Tim Allen claimed the original movie was outdated and that the story needed updating or something along those lines. I didn't think the original was mined well enough. I really thought it was uh, uh, it, it was poor, it went poorly executed. It was just executed in 59. So I didn't want to upgrade anything but the story. Which likely explains why there's so many major differences. He described the family drama in his version of the movie as tragic. It made it seem like it was a genuinely sad and depressing movie. When Matt and I wrote it, we wrote it as though it was a tragedy. This guy's life has fallen apart. Don't get me wrong, it's a good thing that they didn't make the same story a third time, and it's good to have more of an actual plot for modern moviegoers. Modern audiences probably would want a bit more substance than what the original movie had. But this movie tries just a little too hard to distance itself from the original. There are small references to the previous movies, such as Dave Douglas being a district attorney, but those references don't really make the movie feel any more like its source material. With the family drama being extremely shallow and treated so seriously, it just being another one of many mediocre Tim Allen comedy movies, and how generally awkward it just feels watching the movie, I can't really say it's a good movie. Harmless, but not actually good. The mutations in the movie are really cute though, and they actually do add quite a bit to the concept of the series. So that gives the movie a bit of slack for me, due to that and how cute the frog dog is. It's so strange to me that such a simplistic concept managed to spawn five entire movies, and that almost nobody knows about any of them. The plot in each movie is extremely similar, and there are three different timelines for a series that can basically be described as nothing more than Guy Becomes Dog. None of the movies are bad though, just the lesser ones are kinda generic. In fact, the first movie and the Shaggy DA are pretty much legitimately great. I recommend the original Shaggy Dog movie for anyone who enjoys humble black and white comedy movies, and the Shaggy DA for anyone who enjoys the previous movie and once more. It is a shame that two of the TV movies are almost lost media though, and I encourage anyone who made it this far in the video to go to the help section of Disney Plus and hit the give feedback button and request these two obscure films. The Return of the Shaggy Dog is a missing piece to a really strange trilogy, and despite its issues, the 1994 film is a pretty accurate remake of the first movie, and it'd be nice to have an updated way to watch it. Thanks for watching everyone, and thank you for the nice comments and feedback on my previous video essay about Chef Skinner from Ratatouille. I honestly didn't expect anyone to enjoy my ramblings on such a specific thought. When you watch the same movie over and over and over again for whatever reason, your mind just starts to think of things that you didn't notice before. I was probably mostly grasping at straws with Chef Skinner, but I don't know, there's just something about him. I'll be working on more super specific essays in the future, especially when it comes to weird obscure stuff companies probably want us to forget exists. I don't like pestering people to subscribe and like or anything, and I already asked everyone to pester Disney+, so I'm just going to unceremoniously end this video right here and now while I'm still sleeping.